Today, highlights from the 2017 ASCO annual meeting, FDA priority reviews granted in acute myeloid leukemia and renal cell carcinoma, an ODAC hearing for a CAR T-cell therapy in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and the announcement of the 2017 Enclave Giants of Cancer Care. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. At this year's ASCO annual meeting, oncologists from all over the globe gathered in Chicago to hear the latest research in the field. Here are some of the key studies that were presented. First, the addition of the CDK4-6 inhibitor abemaciclib to fulvestrin reduced the risk of disease progression or death by 45% versus fulvestrin alone in pretreated patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer as seen in the international double-blind phase three Monarch II trial that was presented at the meeting. Results showed that the addition of abemaciclib led to an improvement in progression-free survival of 7.1 months. The overall response rates among patients with measurable disease were 48.1% and 21.3% in the abemaciclib and control arms, respectively. In multiple myeloma, Phase one findings from a Chinese study on treatment chimeric antigen receptor T cells targeting B cell maturation protein show that 94% of patients experience a complete remission. Of the 19 patients who have been followed for a minimum of four months, 14 have reached stringent complete response criteria. One patient has experienced partial response and four others have achieved very good partial remission. The frontline combination of pembrolizumab, pemetrexid, and carboplatin reduced the risk of progression or death by 50% and nearly doubled objective response rates versus chemotherapy alone for patients with advanced non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer. Data from cohort G of the Keynote 021 trial showed that after 14.5 months of follow-up, the median progression-free survival was not yet reached in the pembrolizumab arm versus 8.9 months with chemotherapy alone. The 12-month PFS rate was 56% in the pembrolizumab arm, compared with 34% with chemotherapy alone, and the ORR with pembrolizumab was 56.7%, compared with 30.2% for chemotherapy alone. And pembrolizumab continued to show promising signs of clinical activity as a treatment for patients with advanced gastric or gastroesophageal junction cancer and updated findings from the Keynote 059 study presented at the 2017 ASCO annual meeting. The objective response rate with pembrolizumab was 11.6%. In those who specifically received two prior lines of therapy, the ORR was 16.4%. The median progression-free survival was two months, and the median overall survival was 5.6 months, with a 12-month OS rate of 23.4%. Also at the meeting, Three out of four patients representing a range of TREK fusion positive solid tumors responded to the novel pan TREK inhibitor larotrectinib, also known as LOXO 101, and remain on treatment. The findings set the stage for the well tolerated oral agent to become a standard of care for adults and children with any advanced tumor harboring this mutation. Moreover, First line treatment with levotinib improved progression free survival by 3.7 months and was non inferior for overall survival compared with serafinib for patients with unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma. In the open label Reflect or Study 304 study, the median OS with levotinib was 13.6 months compared with 12.3 months for serafinib, the current standard of care and the median PFS with levotinib was 7.4 versus 3.7 months with serafinib. The benefit with frontline treatment with ribocyclib plus letrozole was sustained in an update of the Mona Lisa II study. The agent improved progression-free survival by 9.3 months versus letrozole plus placebo for patients with postmenopausal HR-positive HER2-negative advanced breast cancer. After a median follow-up of 26.4 months, the median PFS was 16 months with letrozole plus placebo, compared with 25.3 months for ribocyclib and letrozole, representing a 43% reduction in the risk of progression or death with the addition of the CDK4-6 inhibitor. The 24-month PFS rate was 54.7% with ribocyclib versus 35.9% for placebo. Finally, out of the ASCO annual meeting, the second generation EGFR inhibitor, docomitinib, reduced the risk of disease progression by more than 40% and 
and resulted in an average 6.5 month improvement in response duration compared with gefitinib as a first line treatment for patients with advanced EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, according to data from the Phase 3 Archer 1050 trial. In other news this week, the FDA granted a priority review designation to sunitinib for use as an adjuvant therapy in patients with renal cell carcinoma who have received nephrectomy and are at high risk for recurrence. The supplemental new drug application for sunitinib is based on findings from the Phase 3 S-TRAC trial, in which adjuvant sunitinib prolonged disease-free survival by 1.2 years versus placebo following nephrectomy for patients with high-risk clear cell RCC. After a median follow-up duration of 5.4 years, the median DFS was 6.8 years in the sunitinib arm compared with 5.6 years with the placebo arm. In higher risk patients, the median DFS was 6.2 versus 4 years for sunitinib and placebo, respectively. The FDA is scheduled to make its final decision by January 2018. In acute myeloid leukemia, the FDA accepted a new drug application from Jazz Pharmaceuticals, granting priority review to the company's novel CPX351 injection. CPX351 is an investigational nanoscale liposome co-formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin at a synergistic 5 to 1 molar ratio. The decision was based on phase 3 results, which showed that CPX351 reduced the risk of death by 31% compared with 7 plus 3 for older patients with high-risk secondary AML. The formulation showed a median overall survival of 9.56 months versus 5.95 months with 7 plus 3. The FDA's Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee has scheduled a public hearing for July 12, 2017 to discuss a biologics license application for Tisagenlis Lucil T, also known as CTL-019, for patients aged 3 to 25 years with relapsed refractory B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This announcement makes Tisagenlis Lucil T the first CAR T cell therapy to go into regulatory review when it won priority review status from the FDA in March. Under the priority review program, CTL-019 is under review for only six months compared with the standard 10-month evaluation. The accelerated review timeline also follows a breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA for CTL-019 and ALL. The designation stems from findings of the Global Phase II ELIANA study, along with a multi-center trial conducted in the United States and a single institution trial. And findings presented at the 2016 ASH annual meeting for the first 50 patients enrolled on ELIANA, CTL-019 was associated with an 82% complete remission, or CR, with incomplete blood count recovery rate. The six-month overall survival was 89%, and the disease-free survival rate was after a median follow-up of 4.3 months. Novartis, the manufacturer of the therapy, has announced plans to request FDA approval for CTL-019 as a treatment for relapsed refractory diffused large B-cell lymphoma by the end of 2017. The company also plans to apply for regulatory approval in Europe. Finally, Enclave announced the recipients of the 2017 Giants of Cancer Care in Chicago. This year, 12 respected healthcare professionals who are advancing the field of oncology by their contributions in research and clinical practice were inducted. The winners were announced on June 1st during an exclusive celebration at the Chicago History Museum. This year's Giants of Cancer Care inductees are in breast cancer, Norman Walmark, MD of Allegheny Health Network, in gastrointestinal cancer, Charles S. Fuchs, MD, MPH of Yale Cancer, in genital urinary cancer, Daniel P. Petrolak, MD, of Yale Cancer Center. In hematologic malignancies, Conti R. Rai, MD, of the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research, Manhasset. In immuno-oncology, Thomas F. Gajewski, MD, PhD, of the University of Chicago Medicine. In lung cancer, David R. Gandera, MD, of the University of California, Davis. In melanoma, John M. Kirkwood, MD, of University of Pittsburgh Department of Medicine. In pediatric oncology, Joseph V. Simone, MD, of Simone Consulting Company. In radiation oncology, Herman D. Suit, MD, MSc, PhD, of Harvard Cancer Center. In scientific advances, drug development, 
Louis C. Cantley, PhD of Meyer Cancer Center. In support of care, Hyman B. Muss, MD of Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. In surgical oncology, John L. Cameron, MD of John Hopkins Medicine. Nominations are also now open for the 2018 Giants of Cancer Care. To nominate, please visit giantsofcancercare.com slash nominate. This week, Dr. Rajan Talak Gupta of Duke Cancer Institute discussed imaging modalities to detect recurrent prostate cancer. Recurrent disease for prostate cancer is an interesting area because one of the things that we've been doing is that uh, really increasing the types of imaging modalities we're able to use. In the past, it was very clear to us that regular CT with contrast was not good enough to really detect recurrent disease. And that was acknowledged by some of the national guidelines that were out there. So if you think about recurrent disease coming in three different forms, you think about local recurrent disease after a radical prostatectomy, think about lymph node recurrence, and think about bone recurrence, all those different things can be um, assessed by using different technologies. So in regards to local disease that can occur after a radical prostatectomy, one of the new techniques that's extremely valuable is multiparametric MRI. What that allows us to do is to visualize the prostate bed in very high resolution, as well as look for areas of abnormal uh, signal on the MRI, as well as abnormal perfusion, to really assess whether or not there may be recurrent disease there. And that's a very common thing for us to be able to do. Some of the new PET agents that have come out have really been uh, shown some great promise as well in looking at that area as well, in addition to being able to look at things like lymph nodes. And so the, the different treatment options for recurrent prostate cancer are now being shaped by some of the imaging modalities because the imaging is really informing us in a much different way than we've ever been able to do before. And I think in the next five or 10 years, that's gonna to continue to really, really grow. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.